So, I believe it is pretty safe to assume that almost everyone here has been around a dog at one point in, or another in their lives. Whether it be their own family dog, a grandparents, or even a friends, we have all interacted with the dog. Now, baby, now it may be really easy for us to under, uh, underestimate these creatures. It's easy to just see a wagging tail and a happy face, but that's not all a dog is. The dog has evolved for hundreds of thousands of years from the wolf and has been domesticated and selectively bred by humans for just as long. A dog, whether it be the smallest of Chihuahua or the biggest of English Mastiffs, have all evolved from the same animal, the wolf. And every dog we interact with is not just a wagging tail and a happy face, but instead an animal that was bred with a purpose and meaning, with instincts and characteristics evolved from the wolf that will never disappear from the dog's psyche. Hello, my name is Casey Hancock, and today I want to talk to you about how the domesticated dog's instincts and characteristics have evolved from the wolf, and how they play largely into how they interact and communicate with us. By understanding the way our dogs are trying to speak to us, we will better be able to connect and understand with the dogs around us. I'm qualified to speak with you about this topic because I've been around dogs my whole life and have always been incredibly interested with the way my favorite animal tries to communicate with me. Ever since I got my own dog, Lily, pictured here, I became really obsessed, actually, with being the best dog owner I could be and have done extensive research on how dogs, on how dogs communicate with us and how their natural instincts play dramatically into their own personal characteristics. So today, after listening to my presentation, I hope you all will be well informed on how your dog is trying to talk to you. In the story of how the dog came from the wolf, we tend to give, give ourselves a little too much credit. The most common assumption is that some hunter-gatherer with an affinity for cuteness adopted some wolf puppies and that over time these tame wolves would have showed their affinity for hunting and that those wolves would have integrated themselves into human society and eventually evolve into dogs. But when we look back on our relationship with wolves throughout more modern history instead of caveman history, we see that we killed all of them in Europe and they're also endangered in the Americas. So it's clear that we haven't shown much appreciation for the wolf throughout more modern history. It's much more likely that wolves approached us in the beginning while scavenging, scavenging around human settlements. Out of natural selection, the wolves that were more aggressive towards humans would have been killed by the humans, but the wolves that were more friendly would have been tolerated and eventually integrate themselves into human society. Friendliness caused strange things to happen in the wolves. They started to look different. Domestication gave them splotchy coats, floppy ears, and wagging tails. In only several generations, these friendly wolves would have become very distinctive from their more aggressive relatives, and hence came the domesticated dog. And this theory came from Brian Hare, who wrote, the art, who wrote this article for National Geographic magazine. We cannot begin to understand the psyche of the dog without first being aware of the way the wolf behaves in the wild. Wolf packs are less about ferocity and more about order. The wolf pack dynamics more resemble those of a teenage clique rather than a group of wild beasts. Of course, they still stalk, stalk prey and get into vicious, vicious fights with each other, but these canines follow an incredibly sophisticated group hierarchy. The most important aspect of wolf mentality that we need to understand is the alpha-beta hierarchy that forms within wolf packs. The alpha is the leader of the pack. In the hierarchy of the wolf pack, he or she is the top wolf, usually the parent of other members. The alpha of the pack does not rule by brawling, but by communication through body language and vocalizations. Body language corresponds with the wolf's rank in the pack. The alpha carries the, tail erect, carries the tails and ear erect, and the whole body gives the impression of benevolent leadership. And these descri descriptions came from the, the article Wolf Pack Structure. All members of the pack respect the alpha, but this relationship is not the only part of the wolf we must understand. We also need to understand the body language communication that goes on between wolves in order to explain the way our dogs convey, convey what they are thinking. The, for, the first behavior we will look at is dominance. A dominant, a dominant wolf stands stiff-legged and tall, with ears erect and forward and hackles bristled slightly. Often the tail is held vertical and curled toward the back. This display shows the wolf's rank to all the others in the pack. The next behavior we will look at is active submission. In active submission, the entire body is lowered and the lips and ears are drawn back. The tail is placed down or halfway or fully between the legs and the muzzle will often point up towards the more dominant wolf. 
The third is passive submission. Passive submission is a more intense form of submission than, than active. In this form of submission, the wolf will actually roll over on its back and display its vulnerable stomach and throat to the more dominant animal. The last and most important behavior is fear and anxiousness. When a wolf is in a state of fear or is anxious, it will try to make its body look small and less conspicuous. Its ears will flatten to its head and its, e and its tail will be tucked between its legs. These wolf body language explanations came from the article Running with Wolves. Now that we have a better understanding of the dog's closest relative, I will explain how all these characteristics still exist in our dog and how we can use this knowledge to better understand what our dog is trying to tell us. The, the first example of something we miscommunicate between us and our dog is the act of a hug. To humans, a hug means love and affection. When a human receives a welcome hug from someone we love, it makes us feel good inside. But what does a hug mean to a dog? Humans are always hugging their dog, and when we do, we are giving the dog. We believe we are giving our dog affection. However, as I previously stated, putting one's body over another in a wolf pack is an act of defiance. To a dog, a hug symbolizes a social status ranking, ranking as dominance, dominance and an invasion of space. <laughs> Lower members of the pack give space to the higher members to show respect. The position of the body is also meaningful to a dog. The one on top represents a higher status ranking. Therefore, when you bend down and wrap your arms around a dog, you are not only on top, but you are in their space. Giving an unfamiliar dog a hug is asserting, asserting your dominance. And if you know nothing about this dog, it can be extremely dangerous because that dog could be dominant and really not appreciate you doing that. <laughs> this is one of the main ways that children are bitten by dogs because a child is excited and will see a dog at a park and run up and try and give it a hug. If this is an unfriendly dog, it will bite the child because it doesn't want to be dominated by another being. Another dog communication that is often misinterpreted by humans is lack of eye contact. For example, after a dog is punished for doing something bad, like sneaking snacks off the table, the dog is yelled at and then will seem to sulk. Head down, sad face, no eye contact. We as humans will project our own emotions onto the dog and believe that it is sad that it got yelled at. The owner will feel bad and try to comfort the dog as if it were a child. But in the dog world, downcast eyes is not a sign of being upset. It is a sign of respect. The dog understands that you are his alpha and is submitting to you by not making eye contact. In a wolf pack, eye contact is an act of defiance. And this trait has evolved into the dog also. When a dog doesn't make eye contact with you, it means he is a submissive dog. So if you ever are introduced to a new dog or you see a dog on the street and he immediately makes eye contact with you, you probably shouldn't approach that dog. It's probably not very nice. One of the most important things we need to understand in the dog world is when a dog is anxious or in a state of fear. Once again, people who don't understand dog language are bitten all the time because they don't know how to approach a dog who is exhibiting obvious signs of fear. A person who finds a dog on the street may approach the dog because it has wide eyes, tails tucked between its legs, and flattened ears. To many, and because we as humans personify our own emotions onto animals, may view this as a dog that is scared or in need of help, when in reality this dog is in a state of fear and is very anxious, just as the wolf who exhibits the same body language as I said earlier. Many will approach the dog, try to corner it, and see if it has a collar to see if we can help the dog. But in the dog world, this is an act of defiance. We're approaching this dog, cornering it, and trying to grab it. So instead of trying to corner the dog, you should approach the dog in a lowered state. Avoid eye contact and speak in a soothing tone. Put your hand out, let the dog smell you, and let him decide if he trusts you or not. Dogs feel the energy of those around them. So if you are approaching a dog in an anxious or an excited state, the dog will feel that and will project those own emotions. These cases of dog behavior are from Shannon McGuire's website, who is a leader in the dog behavior world. This case of dogs being able to feel energy has also been evolved from the wolf. Wolves do not have a spoken language, so they speak to each other through body language and energy. A dog feels what you feel, as stated by Caesar Milan, the best dog trainer in the world, who is also known as the dog whisperer. If you are anxious, your dog will be too. If you are scared, your dog will feel it. If you are happy, your dog will feel it. 
This is one of the main reasons why dogs make some of the best therapy animals and also why dogs are man's best friend. So in closing, we humans have successfully been able to domesticate the dog, but we will never be able to de-animalize a dog and remove their natural characteristics. We cannot personify human emotions onto our dog, as this is how many behavioral and bite cases can arise. While we are treating a dog in such a way that we think will make them happy, we are in fact doing just the opposite. By not understanding a dog's natural instincts, we create a confused and unhappy dog. To happily coexist with man's best friend, we need to understand not only them, but the wolves from which they came. Thank you.